Welcome to that episode, Anglican Unscripted 666. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 5th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. And before we get too far, there are skyscrapers around the world that don't have the 13th floor. There are places around the world that are superstitious about numbers. Anglican Unscripted is not one of those places. Um, We are going to have an Anglican Unscripted episode 666. You know, it's... It is a num- another number. Yes, it's the Mark of the Beast. Uh, it has a lot of fun with fiction in Hollywood. Um, but it's just another episode where two guys sit down and talk to you about the world of Christendom and Anglicanism. And my AC just turned on. Let me, you know, I think it turned on without me knowing about it. That's kind of scary, George. <laughs> I, just, I don't want to be superstitious. We were just talking about 666 and things are starting to go weird here on the set. Oh, well. But um, it's another number. And yes, it has biblical significance. It has a, uh, significance to the end times. And Hollywood has done a wonderful job of uh, making 666 fiction. Where it is actually a real number. And... You guys as an audience are expecting some really big theological uh, discussion here on the end times. We don't have to do that. We're going to show you examples of people who think they're in the end times. I remember, and it was August 2nd, 1990, the first Gulf War. I lived in Huntsville, Alabama at the time, and I only had access on my car radio to AM channels, where all the preachers were telling us, that the Gulf War, because it was in the Middle East and it was dealing with characters out of Revelation, that this was the end times. This was going to be the rising of the Antichrist. This was going to be the end. Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. Well, you know, a couple decades later, we learned a lot. Saddam Hussein was not the Antichrist. He was certainly a bad a despot and uh, deserved the death that he uh, so f- uh, found himself under. But, you know, we always look at the times with this microscope and say, is this it? Is this it? I remember going back and reading books that people thought, you know, the times of the Nazis were the, the end times. And before that, World War I was the end times. We always, as people, find ourselves under this microscope looking, is this the end times? And you know something? We need to stop that. We are called to seek Jesus first. In all things, you are to be on this earth looking for Jesus, not looking for the Antichrist. Please do not lose focus. And that's my my sermon on uh, 666. However, I'm going to bring up a story here. If you live right now in Africa, you have a volcano erupting and surrounding your town and killing people. You're going to think this is the end times, George. The Anglican Church in the Congo is one of the most oppressed, most poor, most uh, miserable places on earth to live. Uh, this past weekend, Muslim extremists came into a North Kivu in the northeast of the Congo and they raided a village, killed 55 people, took some people off to be sold into slavery, and they murdered the local Anglican priest and burned the church down. That's not unusual. That happens all the time, uh, including the murder of the clergy, uh, whether it's the African, whether the Anglican priest, the Catholic priest, the Seventh-day Adventist yeah, pastor. Yeah. They kill. They kill the Christian ministers. Well. Meanwhile, little little ways down, uh, going south, a volcano has erupted outside the city of Goma, which is the largest city in eastern Congo. And the lava flows, Goma is on a lake, one of the Great Lakes, and the lava flows have flowed on either side of the city. Some Anglican churches and other churches have been burned to the ground. People have died. Uh, people have, now, volcano uh, lava moves slowly, 
but some older people basically have been left in their homes, they've perished, and the roads are out of Goma, have been cut off. So actually, I'm told more people have died who have fl trying to flee the volcano by getting in boats, trying to cross the lake, which is a giant lake, at an inland sea. More people have died from their boats foundering with too many people in them than have been actually killed by lava flows. So the, the sense that the end of the world is coming with the persecution and death and volcanoes and, and his mass hysteria, uh, the people in the Congo have more cause to fear that than we do in the United States, uh, no matter what your opinion of Donald Trump or Joe <laughs> Biden is. No. Uh, but in honesty, politics every day gets crazier. Here and, in America, in the West, in Europe, it, it, it's it's parody it's satire you can't believe the stories you're reading yeah and, and kevin was right kevin mentioned in the in the uh, second world war uh some hasidic groups in poland were ecstatic when hitler invaded poland because uh if you take hitler's adolf hitler's name and you apply kabbalah numerology to it it <laughs> it can be uh, changed to uh, the messiah is coming yeah. So the uh, Hitler is coming, uh, even though he's the Antichrist that comes before the Messiah, it was the time of the millennium. So there were some Hasidic Jews in Poland in 1939, ecstatic that Germany invaded. They were all dead within a year and a half, two years, but people just get silly about, uh, they try to explain the signs of the times uh, by... Uh, now, most of our viewers are not people who take numerology seriously. But in Africa, there is a very strong belief in the spirit world among people in the United States who I've worked with, who I would, you would probably call poorer, less well-educated. There's a strong belief in astrology and horoscopes and omens and signs. And part of the Christian life is to break the hold of this demonic over people. I remember when you and I were in Tanzania for the uh, primates meeting, and I took a day trip up to uh, see Dr. Livingston's uh, uh, ruins up uh, north of where we were staying. Spent a whole day with the driver, and he took me all around and gave me a quick tour. We stopped in a village of probably 60 or 70 people, and everybody was wearing a little red amulet. Uh, a little necklace around their thing. It was a, a, They all had this identical amulet. I said, what's that for? And it was a Christian community. And they believed this red amulet that they were given to by a pastor was going to save them from the Antichrist. Whoa. I, 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 I didn't know they watched the 700 Club in Northern <laughs> Tennessee. Like, like... Pat Robertson's reached that far? Or... Yeah. It, but it, when you want to look for things that are wrong, I, I, I look at just the modern day prophecies. You know, that Donald Trump was going to be president again, that uh, the Antichrist, the only reason Donald Trump would lose is if the Antichrist were walking the earth. If you go to YouTube right now and you Google uh, who is the Antichrist or where is the Antichrist, they have these well-made professional videos uh, discussing who they think the Antichrist is. There is a whole... A subgroup of Christianity who spends all their days and nights worried about who the Antichrist is and not worried about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And boy, you guys, you know, <laughs> Jesus actually warned us about people like you. And I, it, <laughs> now I'm not trying to, to, to knock people because I received many, many emails from people around the time of the national elections here in the United States that. You know, Father George, I saw this minister on YouTube saying that there's going to be divine intervention and Donald Trump will be re-sworn uh, in on the uh, January 22nd or whatever it was um, because of this sign and this prophecy and this and that. Uh, and I would say, you know, I, uh, I hear what you're saying, but we cannot apply, we cannot use the Bible in that way to try to basically we've come to a conclusion that we want a certain person to be president and then we're going to pick out those passages in the scriptures that seems to make our uh, wishes come true. It's the Bible that should lead us, not we leading the Bible. 
Now, you have to say this in a pastoral way because people have bona fide political fears Absolute, and hopes sure. and dreams. Yeah. But and it just happens again and again and again that uh, people, some people use Christianity in a non-Christian way. They use it as a form of paganism, as a form of numero as a form of divination, as a form of magic rather than, as Kevin said, seeing in it the salvation through Christ and Christ alone. I remember probably the only time there was divine intervention in a presidential election here in America was Al Gore, Bush II, the hanging chads from Florida that I'm sure, you know, God just kind of pushed it towards Bush because Gore was bad, George. Gore was really bad. Oh, man, Gore was bad. So let's move on to Crazy Bishop News. Is, this is a program, Anglican Scripture, where we talk about uh, religion news and Anglican news. We have some great bishop stories that uh, will just satisfy you as an Anglican viewer. Canadian bishop inhibited George. He's only been in office like 10 days. Well, Lincoln McEwen, McKeon, uh I don't know, M-C-K-O-E-N. That's First Canadian I've ever met named Lincoln, by the <laughs> yeah. way. Uh, he he was he's bishop of the the the, uh, the diocese of the people or the territory of the people. That's right. Now, now what is that? Well, about twenty odd years ago, the diocese of Caribou, which is inland British Columbia, was sued for abuse committed in the residential schools it owned that were attended by Indians. The government rounded up all the Indians for about 100 years and shipped them to schools, which they contracted with the Catholics and the Anglicans and everybody to run for them. Some of these schools have perverts on the staff. Just, just you know. Uh, and it was bad at the time to send, you know, to forcibly send uh, Natives American there was really. And, well, the long and the short of it was Caribou was bankrupted. So what was the Diocese of Caribou became the Anglican Parishes of the Interior, and then they renamed themselves the Territory of the People. It's based in Kamloops, which is in uh, central, uh, central Eastern BC. Well, its Bishop uh, Lincoln McEwen, uh, who's a real liberal, you know, he's into reparations for the Indians or First Peoples as they call them, Canada, uh, into gay marriage, into social justice. He's into every little thing you can think of. Well, on June 1st, the primate announced that uh, we in Canada have very strong standards of trust that we must follow, and I regret to say that I have sacked this bishop, uh, Lincoln Bishop McEwen. And his neighboring bishop, Anna Greenwood Lee, two days later said, you may have heard that uh, Bishop Lincoln was sacked. He was sacked because of sexual misconduct, and he'll have a trial. Uh, but don't tell anybody. And don't talk to the media. A woman releases a pastoral statement uh, saying, don't tell anybody what's happening, and puts it on their website. So this, 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 this guy is... Uh, I got to tell you, if you get who in Ca who gets nailed for sexual misconduct in Canada anymore, unless it's with little Indian boys, uh, and there, there's the problem. I mean, uh, the bar has been set very high to be inhibited or dethroned or defrocked in Canada. I mean, really high. The bar is way up here, and I'm looking here. We have another story from Glipsland. Well, we, we should say he hasn't had his trial. No, no, absolutely. Uh, innocent. He's not been found guilty. Innocent. Well, in America, in America, we believe he's innocent. Canadian. We, he's Canadian. <laughs> I don't know what they think anymore. Uh, but in America, you're innocent until proven guilty. So these are the allegations that have been raised against him, and the mm. bishop has not yet. Uh, now, here's the funny thing. Up until a day before this thing came out, he was really active. They had a story that uh, the some gr 215. Uh, unmarked graves were found at a former residential school that had been in operation for a hundred plus years so that like if a little Indian child died of uh, cholera or something Smallpox. or other, if they yeah. died you know, as people did die before mm -hmm. vaccinations they would bury the child they wouldn't send the, the body home or they wouldn't put it in a graveyard they would just bury it with no marking and 
he had this letter saying how awful and it's genocidal the treatment that we have and he was in full roar uh, and the shame that will never be erased and then the next day he really must have done something bad because next day he got nailed by the primate and he's out the door but that's not the wackiest story in the Anglican world George we have another uh, story posted here on uh, Anglican Inc. Uh, and I'm going to go here. Is this the Bad Bishops episode, Kevin? <laughs> this is the fun bishop. Bishop in Gippsland supports Trelore. the Synod motion endorsing extramarital affairs. <laughs> That's David Olds, our good friend and co, co, uh, co correspondent. Uh, yeah. correspondent. Um, interpretation diocese of gippsland which is middle of nowhere in australia i think in the i think it's in the victoria state mm -hmm. uh to the south of uh, sydney around you know, i think it's northwest of melbourne the actual diocese well gippsland has a very liberal youngish bishop and it's he's been on the leading edge of the gay marriage thing and he's wanted to change church he's wanted to go full tech full can Anglican Church of Canada wacky on gay marriage and the way for them to get there is to change the definition of chastity and moral conduct for the clergy so they want to change the definition where if you're a priest and if you, you engage in an extramarital affair in Sydney that's considered grounds to be kicked out because that's moral turpitude well, it's not, not just grounds the, that will get you kicked out. Yes, yes. <laughs> but in Gippsland, they want to change that definition. Now, they don't want to. They don't want to sort of set up uh, the uh, swingers club of Gippsland. Rather, they want to have it so that uh, gays and lesbians who cannot get married in the church now can have relationships with people and not get nailed for having sex outside of marriage and still be a clergy. It still be a clergy, but yeah. the way they're wording it is that you can be a swinger and have a wife and a girlfriend and a mistress and still be a good priest because the moral definitions have changed. So I don't know what they're up to in Gippsland uh, and whether they're allowed to. I, I don't know if they can. They probably can do that on a local level, mm -hmm. but I don't think that anybody who behaves that way who moves out of the diocese, which I think most people in Gippsland want to do, uh, well, I mean, how far removed is this that a bishop can have a sexual relationship with, with a charge with somebody under him, you know, in his office? That, hey, it's okay. You That's know? happened in the Episcopal Church. It's, it's, and it's been okay there, too. You know, it just, it well, was, it's only okay. It's only okay if it's same sex. That's right. If it's, uh, if it's a woman, then, uh, then you get nailed for adultery, just mm -hmm. as Cy Jones. But uh, if it's the... Well, we won't, won't go to, down that road. No, do, do, no, no libel, no slander here. Uh, let's talk about a, a horrible anniversary. And uh, this is just that, you know, my wife and I got married like 31 years ago. I should know this off the top of my head. 32 years ago, when I was uh, still uh, a little college boy, Tiananmen Square was in the news. And we would watch the tension every night on CNN as they would have a live camera showing all the uh, students that were e erecting statues and taking over Tiananmen St Square and kind of the first Occupy Tian Tiananmen uh, revolt was going on. And the rumors around here in the West were like, this is it. When the students get involved, when the young people get involved, there can be a, a successful revolt and revolution. And, you know, they, th these westernized young people have fallen in love with the West and with Europe. They may finally seek their freedom. There'll be a little blood. Don't worry. There'll be some blood, but they may be able to overthrow uh, the People's Party of China and all will be well with the world. And then one night, all the lights went off. All the cameras went off, all the live feed from CNN went off, and the next day the square was clean. And China said the students left. They got up and left. We thought for sure they'd still be there too. Lo and behold, they left. We never got a death toll. We know that uh, hundreds 
uh, if not more, were killed and just quietly removed by the secret police. Uh, we have some video footage of what happened. Um, but when we look back on Tiananmen Square, we always look back at a young Asian man with a grocery bag standing in front of a tank. And that is the symbol of uh, liberty and freedom. I will not move. Well, he moved. <laughs> he moved. <laughs> but he moved. Well, actually, the tank moved. And whether he tank moved or not, it didn't matter. <laughs> no, they grabbed him out of the way. But so Tiananmen Square was, for a moment in time, very successful. But China was so, and I, I hate to say this, wise in completely erasing it from memory. There's no mention of it as uh, anything that ever happened in China. And we, we're remembering it less and less and less here in the West. The uh, situation in China is bad. Um, and it's not, it's bad on several levels. Mm -hmm. um, in London, there's this uh, public uh, trial. It's not a real trial. It's, a, uh, it's, it's akin to the sort of things they had in the 70s about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a trial of China for its treatment of the Uyghurs, the Muslims in uh, Xinjiang, in the, the west, western uh, province of China. And there's test, uh, testimony of victims, testimony of perpetrators who've defected, and there's a real bona fide genocide where the Chinese government is seeking to destroy a people who are a threat to the uh, state. Uh, these people will be destroyed. They'll be. It, they'll either be. It's the Borg. They either will be uh, assimilated, because resistance is futile. And there is fear among Christians in China that the Christian Church is next. Why do I say that? Well, the, the Falun Gong for years has been the subject of uh, of terrible persecution, uh, such that we now have bona fide document cases where they kill members of this sect for their body organs. When they're arrested, they're blood, body blood typed and tissue typed. And then when an order comes up for the for a kidney or for a liver or whatever, that person will be executed and the kidney will be provided to the client. This is happening. This is not bad science fiction from the no, 70s. And, and it, you know what's happening because Biden knows it's happening and he's trying to call them on it. When low lackluster presidential president biden gets involved it's bad <laughs> well in in china in hong kong they had a very low key celebration of the uh, tiananmen square anniversary i don't even think the anglicans held one i think it was only the catholics mm -hmm. because hong kong is no longer hong kong the hong kong we knew it's no longer the vibrant dynamic industrial hub and giant China has decided that it is in their interest to assimilate Hong Kong. And the, I am told, I have no first-hand knowledge, I am told that in China proper itself, well, here, here's what I do know. Uh, there are some Chinese Christian publications that are allowed to be published because this church is still legal. The three self patriotic movement and the China Christian Council can still publish things because they're government sponsored. And they've had all these articles about people are not coming back to church after a COVID. We wonder why. And could it be that uh, could it be that the Chinese government now has cameras in every church? And when you go to church, your face is recorded, your name is taken down and the state knows that you are a hostile element, socially unfriendly? Could it be that children under 18 are forbidden to come into church, that if you catechize a child, you'll get arrested for brainwashing and for uh, anti-state activities? Um, things are bad. The, when it, I'm not even just talking about the house church movement. I'm talking about the official state-sanctioned churches are now under outright persecution it's it was it started a year and a half two years ago with the outward science of crosses of the roof of buildings being blown up and torn down well i it's think moved it moved to the arresting of pastors and now the state has just passed laws governing the organization of churches 
where in essence every aspect of church life must must be vetted by the Communist Party and the regime. And I think it really started really hard when they started implementing, I think seven years ago, social credits. Mm -hmm. We have a social credit system where uh, those people that we trust, those people that do good for the society, that are members of the Communist Party, that are uh, teaching communism and preaching communism and are the evangelists of communism, your social credit is high. You can go where you want, do what you want, get your what you want. Go to, your children can go to college. Yep. You're, you know, it, it's the, the, you know, Kevin and I uh, worked for years to put money aside. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to pay for private school education. Oh, yeah. China, yeah. Uh, that's a gift to the state. And mm -hmm. if, you know, and for our political views, our children would be, uh, have to become factory workers. They couldn't become professionals or whatever their talents would lead them to be because of the social credit system. And now with the social credit system, you your camera shows your face shows up on camera at a church, you can't get the business loan. You can't get your kids in school. You can't go to the nice restaurants. You are ostracized by your community uh, and that nice apartment you had and that brand new uh, skyscraper in the middle of Wahoo, that's no longer available to you. You're down in the uh, the basement barracks. Or you want to live in Shanghai, you want to leave Peking, huh? nope, sorry, you're yeah. back in the village. Or you're in Outer Mongolia or Manch Manchuria, it, it's really bad. Now, it's not as bad as North Korea. North Korea, murder, if you are a Christian and you're discovered, you're killed. Or you're sent to a, a concentration camp, which is the same thing. It's yeah, death. And not only you, but three generations, uh, your parents, yourself, and your children, or your grandchildren, your children, and yourself, uh, because Christianity is a direct threat to the dear leader, because the, the mythology of the North Korean state has basically taken over so many concepts of Christianity that if people understand, hey, you know, they're making this up in Pyongyang, that the dear leader, all these things they say about him is what you know, we say about Christ and the omnipotence of the Father and all this and that. Um, any deviation from total orthodoxy and loyalty to the, the Kim family is is a death penalty. And faith, private belief, is the major, major trigger that will kill you. We're not there yet in China. Now for some good news. There are more Christians in China now than before the revolution. For some reason, and you know, we know why, persecution is a spark that kindles the fire of uh, Christian faith, worship, and prayer life, and evangelism, and building the church. And you know, we, we've seen this repeated throughout history. And there are hundreds of millions. I guess it's 130 million. So it's not hundreds of millions. 130 million Christians evangelical uh, like you and me in China underground I'm not going to name names I actually met a priest of a liturgical variety that you would be pleased if you knew uh, his denomination who has a hundred and seventy two thousand people in his greater flock of underground church Hundreds, I know a lot of people. I got 40 last week. 40 was really good. Well, you know, they're not being persecuted. <laughs> you know, uh, 172,000 persecuted really, you know, that's 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 a different thing. And so, um, there is good news behind persecution. You know, we don't want to say that this is the, the end of the church, this is how the church survives, this is how the church thrives. And, you know, it is what it is. From time to time, you'll see, uh, I'll give a plug for it. There's a China Aid, which is based in all places, I think, uh, Odessa, Texas, or uh, uh, Midland, Texas. Uh, it's, uh, it's a window into the Chinese world that you're not going to get from the American media, which is basically bought and paid for by China. Um, if you're going to have a if you're going to have a reporter based in Peking, you can only say and do certain things. Um, China Aid gets report from the people of China, from defectors on the ground of what's happening there. 
it's really a valuable resource if you want to understand what's happening to people in our world. And some, I, it sometimes makes me sort of ashamed because I moan and groan about my circumstances, but I'm not in North Korea. I'm not in China. I'm not in uh, Sudan or Nigeria. Or Vietnam still. Yeah. Or Vietnam. Yeah. All right, let's transition. Another story, kind of a fun story. Well, not really. It hurt a lot. Uh, people remember it was 9-11, 2019. I was on a bicycle ride, and my bicycle and my body came into contact with a car headed in the opposite direction. We had a head on. And my body caused damage to the car, of course. But the car caused much more damage to my body, and it was a painful experience. It trashed the bike, trashed my helmet. And it was at this point, Kevin, for the first time in a long time, had to deal with the insurance industry. And the first thing they wanted to do, Kevin, are you going to sue? I'm not really a suing type of person. I Yes, this is the gold mine. Anybody will want being hit by your unattentive driver. Uh, I, I'd be a millionaire. I don't need that. I want a new bike. I want a new helmet. I want pay medication because it hurts like hell. And you got to pay the medical bill, the ambulance bill, and all that. And they said, okay, we'll do that. If you if you promise not to sue, sign this thing that you're gonna, not going to sue, and you get all the money you want for your, your little toys. Great. Then we wait. And wait and wait and wait for the check and check and check. And I send the bills and send the invoices and wait and wait and wait and wait. And finally, some year and a half later, they finally settled the ambulance bill. And then I got my bicycle, I got my helmet, and got my you know, New Jersey that was all ripped apart. Insurance companies don't want to pay. They, they, they want to avoid it. They want to keep the money in the bank for interest, even though they're contractually obligated to pay. It's not like they want to pay. And so when I read this story about the Episcopal Church suing an insurance company for paying the defense fees of churches that went on to the ACNA, I'm like, <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> you know, why not? Tech has sued everybody, anything. Why not sue insurance companies? Because you thought they wanted to pay? They didn't want to pay. They had to be forced to pay because they had a contract that said they would pay the defense fees of these churches. And as a person who's just recently dealt with the insurance companies, I'm not a fan of the insurance companies who won in court. I'm not a fan of the Episcopal Church. It's just one of these crazy stories, George. Out of the middle the, of nowhere. It, 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 it shows the adage... Uh, 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 if you your own lawyer, you have a fool for a client. Uh, the Episcopal Church in South Carolina discovered that the church insurance company of Vermont was paying the litigation bills of the breakaway congregations. And they responded emotionally. The congregations all had policies which the church insurance company that one of the covered items was this sort of litigation. Well, fullness of time the the fight started and the parishes turned to the church insurance company and said okay cover, pay it church insurance of vermont said yeah i don't think so because you're no longer episcopalian they went to arbitration and uh, may not have been legal arbitration but they basically didn't want to pay it but eventually they were compelled to say well yeah the contract says we have to then they started paying their bills. Now the church, then the break, the church, Episcopal Church in South Carolina, responded emotionally, and they sued in federal court the church insurance company for paying the bills of the congregations of the diocese of South Carolina, um, which they had to do because the contract they had with them said they had to pay it. There's no Dennis Cannon in the insurance industry. And it went to uh, local South Carolina District Court, found for the Anglican parishes, went up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals, in a unanimous verdict, said, look, it may make sense that the uh, money was used to uh, buy the congregations to pay their legal bills, but so what? Uh, that's a speculation. And, you know, basically we go by the contracts here. 
So this and so basically this is over because I very much doubt the U.S. Supreme Court would would handle such a clear case that was a three to zero decision against the Episcopal Church in South Carolina. And any outside competent legal advice would say, don't throw your money away on this issue. But the Episcopal Church in South Carolina's lawyers who litigate this are also its lay leaders. And so I don't know if they're getting paid for their labors by themselves, but you know, they just are not thinking these things. Um, yeah, I, 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 well, I mean, there's legal issues, there's dealing with churches that want to leave, and then there's spite. And this, this goes right into the realm of spitefulness. You know, not only are we going to uh, make it difficult for your church to exist in this diocese, not only are we going to change the doctrines and disciplines of this diocese, we are going to make sure that there's nothing you can do about it. Look at Diocese of Albany. Uh, and if you want to leave, we will take your church, we will sue you, and we will sue anybody who wants to protect you or defend you. Oh, Episcopal Church, you have set the bar so high for bad churches. Well, we need we need to distinguish. Uh, I very much doubt this was a decision made in at in New York City. I, there is a degree of autonomy, and that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's a mm -hmm. bad thing when the autonomy allows people who are too close to the situation make decisions that are stupid uh to be honest but hey 815 makes stupid decisions yes and actually this is sort of the reverse where uh peter lee of virginia let the churches go then new york overruled it and threw mm -hmm. all this money away uh that you know basically served no real per didn't serve to build the christian faith uh it, it just served to make Episcopal Church and Anglicans look ridiculous in the eyes of the world. No, yeah. all right. So, I think we have covered. Oh no, we we have. Uh, it's an inconsequential story, but it okay. does uh, speak to our bad bishop episode. The it's not on my was... list. I have a list of six items. I don't have another bad bishop story here. What's going on? Oh, the Bishop of Saint David's in in, in Wales. Okay, Joanna Penberthy. All right. Uh, Bishop Pemberthy, I think, has a has a diocese with an average Sunday attendance of about 3,000, which is about the size of my deanery uh, in northwestern rural Florida, okay? Uh, except I think we have more pickup trucks than she does. She has tweeted about 40,000 times over the past few years. I think it's like 20 or 30 times a day on average. And she is a aggressively left-wing political. Now there's no surprise she once ran uh, when she was a mere priest to be a labor counselor in a local town, but she has been vociferous in being anti-Brexit and pro this and pro that. She wears her emotions and her politics on her sleeve and Twitter is the way she lets every single thought, stream of consciousness spill out. So uh, kind of like Trump. So Trump is good at it. Trump is Trump, good at it. Trump is a master of Twitter, yes. Trump teaches people how to do this. Yeah. She should read Trump. Not She may not agree with the content, but no. with the methodology. Well, this Trump wannabe uh, had this, had this uh, tweet, never, 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 never trust the Tories, where she's basically denouncing uh, the Conservative Party in the UK as being untrustworthy and not worth their time. Now, the joke of it is, the MP representing her area of St. David's is a member of the Conservative Party. That Western Wales is a conservative area. And so the actual people in her diocese, I don't know how many hundred thousand people there are, but there are only 3,000 in her diocese. Conservatives? Uh, are, would be conservatives, huh? and yet she is so out of touch that she thinks it's a good idea to engage in that level of party politics. And then she was caught out on this, not by the church in Wales, but by social media. And she defended herself saying, well, this is my personal opinion. I'm sorry, you're a bishop. 
you don't have a personal <laughs> opinion on this issue. No. And then she went on to say, well, I'm sorry if the words offended people. No, you offended people with your words. And now she's taken down her whole Twitter stream, which is probably going to land her in psychoanalysis because the woman needs to vent. But we're ta- her, her one notable feat is that she was the first woman bishop in Wales. And she's done nothing that a true this is no rosa parks okay this is no margaret thatcher this is no person who is trailblazing a path because of merit because of courage and because of dignity this is just tokenism at its most extreme of incompetence in mediocrity and you've got a diocese that is more I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't criticize the church in Wales, but it is basically a joke within the Anglican world. Um, it, when we hear stuff about Wales, we have to pre-roll our eyes before we read the story. Yes. In, the, yeah. in that the, the faithfulness and the enthusiasm and the growth in the Church of Wales is it's frighteningly bad. Yeah. Uh, I, we need to cover this because we talked about it on the show. But uh, Sydney Minister offers praise for Jonathan Fletcher. Got a lot of comments. This is a story we posted uh, on May 23rd. And we talked about it. I think we mentioned it here on the show that this guy from Sydney says, you know, Jonathan Fletcher's a cool dude. It has an amazing ministry and has done wonderful things. Somebody talked to this minister and said, you're not paying attention here. <laughs> <laughs> you may have missed the last five years of news on Anglican Unscripted talking about Jonathan Fletcher. You may have missed the victim statements, the trials, the you, the stuff from Justin Welby. And this uh, pastor from Sydney has now walked back his praise of Jonathan Fletcher. Simon Manchester is a very prominent North Sydney ministry. He's now retired, but he had a radio ministry along with his parish that had 100,000 listeners a weekend. Great preacher, wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. He's known Jonathan Fletcher for 40 plus years. He was a colleague. Difference was that Simon Manchester uh, was happily married is a, uh, and is not the sort of person that Jonathan Fletcher would sort of focus on to be one of his victims. And as such, He's not, uh, he, he was totally unaware of the bad things. And all, besides, he's in Australia. Well, he posted a uh, tweet, uh, no, I'm sorry. He wrote a letter to evangelicals now with his wife saying, Fletcher's been a friend of ours for 40 years. And, you know, he said the sort of thing that you say at the beginning of a scandal, that this is a friend of mine. And I hope it's not true. Instead, he waited five years after this thing started to say, he's a friend of mine. And, I hope After, it's not true. His timing was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, Julian Mann, our correspondent in the UK, wrote a story about this that was the story of the week in terms of viewership. Tens of thousands or whatever it was. Yeah. At least at least five people read it. <laughs> uh, and it caused a tremendous blowback. Well, Manchester has tweeted a, an apology and I think it's a genuine apology because it's so befuddled. It's like, how did I step into this? I I wasn't condoning abuse. This is a guy I knew, and he, he's he's always used the right fork at dinner, and he's never been anything but a gentleman to me. I'm sorry for implying that the things that he did were not true. So he's he's walked this back. But Kevin, I think you're right because. I know questions were put to the Archbishop of Sydney mm -hmm. about, are you happy that somebody's doing this to Moore College where he teaches preaching? And I think it just... Well, the the, the Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Fletcher affair, uh, controversy, horror story, is an oddity. I have spoken with, over the last three or four years, four members of his church. Only one had an inkling that there was something going on. The lay people in the church had no idea. The, 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 the basic lay person sitting in the church was hearing the great preaching, was watching what was ha what happening uh, as the church was growing and being exciting in the community. The people who had the inkling, one of the clergy people I spoke to, 
said, yeah, but everything else is so exciting. We didn't, you know, we, we were looking at the wrong things. We, you know, the, the clues were there, but the, you, we weren't putting all the pieces together um, because it wasn't consistent abuse widespread. It was abuse with certain people at certain times, at certain locations, and nobody was able to put all the pieces together till it was all done. And this clergy person I, I spoke to was very honest and uh, just said, we didn't get it. And this, this, is, this is the horror story. You know, a, a great horror story starts with a, uh, a, a very bad person in a barn with a hay fork about to kill somebody. That's, that's the, the classic horror story. Here was just a clergy person doing what uh, you expected a clergy person to do. Uh, and boom. What a mess. I'm, I'm going to show that I can be just as foolish as Simon Manchester. Kevin and I didn't talk about this, but it's just uh -oh. hit me. I, there's a mini uh, furore in England. It was about last week, two weeks ago. Uh, the news reporter Martin Bashir, uh, who was the religion editor at the BBC, has, there was a big scandal causing uh, the former director of the BBC to resign as the head of the National Gallery. 25 years ago, Bashir got an interview with uh, late Pr Princess Diana, where Princess Diana yeah. made the famous statement, there were always three of us in the marriage. And it, it was a journalistic coup de grace. Well, he used sneaky methods to get this interview. Correct. Where he uh, forged some bank statements to show them to Diana, said, look, your servants are getting money and they're selling your story, so you might as well tell your story to me and to the BBC. That's not how you do it in journalism. I've but never he, done that. He, <laughs> we've never done that. And that was 25 years ago. And the Martin Bashir I knew when he was religion reporter at the BBC was a decent, hardworking, honest reporter. And this was investigated at the time by the BBC, and he apologized for it, and he's apologized since then, and he's been very ill. He had a heart bypass. And I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes you just have to let the past be the past. You did something bad 25 years ago. That's almost a different person. And unless he did it last week, I think he should climb off his back. And, you know, he's no longer with the BBC. He's retired. Just let it go. And, you know, let's attack. Let, let's talk about things that are happening now, not beat up somebody for what they've apologized for for over 25 years ago. Well, I mean, journalism in the UK is so much worse than it ever was here or ever will be here in America. It's tabloid driven to, an ex you know, it's, it's National Enquirer in 10 different papers. I, I would sort of argue yes and no, Kevin, because yes, it's worse in that they have very low standards of, but at the same time, they're not telling outright lies. They're not, but and the what BBC we saw from repeated, the repeated, yeah, okay. Well, what we saw from the American media over the past, over the past two, three years with the Trump, with the Russia oh. collusion host of prostitutes being in beds in Moscow was outright lies, which they knew were lies. There's a, there's a lawsuit going on where uh, Alan Dershowitz, the Harvard lawyer, uh, is suing CNN for uh, defamation. Now, defamation cases in the United States are almost impossible to win because you have to prove malice of forethought, that you went out of your way to lie. Well, what CNN did was they took Dershowitz's statements before the Senate and in public and edited them to make them sound like he meant the exact opposite of what he was saying. And last week, a federal judge declined to dismiss the CNN lawsuit, which now means it goes to discovery and investigation and Dershowitz will win. And he's asking $300 million because it was CNN knew it was lying and deliberately did this. Now this could $300 million for a media well, company. Did that, they just paid that kid off from, uh, we don't know how much they paid the kid, but yeah, it was two seventy-five. Well, Three hundred so, million to Alan that's a lot. <laughs> Jeez, I don't I think the church insurance company of Vermont <laughs> is going to be covering that one for him. No. I'm sorry. You know, but, it just 
See, but see, that's the difference. Barton Bashir didn't lie. Yeah. He let he lied to get this story, mm-hmm. but he didn't lie with the story. In other words, he didn't. T- the story he told wasn't a falsehood. He just used unprincipled methods to get the story twenty five years ago, versus last year, at lying about what they actually were saying. So. It's, it's like who's a bigger bastard, Hitler or Stalin? I don't know. Uh, I do remember having this conversation once. I, early on, late nineties, I was a, a high school teacher. Not a, a, a well-known thing about Kevin, and I had a discussion once with the students, and I said, "You need to know this. Most likely, you guys will never be interviewed by the police. You will never be in the police." investigation room with a detective on the other side and you sitting here talking except and for you questions. fred I, I'm, yeah, said, I'm said, <laughs> it was an inner city school however and so i'm i'm like you know however you have to know this fact about american law you are not allowed to lie the detective is the police are they're allowed to say whatever they want to get a confession out of you to or to lead you into a confession they're allowed to lie journalists are allowed to lie until they're caught and so hopefully uh you know we have this period now where people are 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 over this trump thing and they can start reporting real news and i know they are here's here's the first clue that real news is finally being reported and that that colombo that journalistic integrity that there's a story here is is bubbling up Remember the 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 virus Corona was something that happened in a, a food market in China. Yeah, people were eating bats or something. Bat bat diet, and that was the whole story throughout the Trump presidency and uh, immediately after. But now that Trump's gone and they got nothing better to do that than do real journalism. By the way. We had these stories when Trump was president that it was the Wahoo uh, uh, virus factory, whatever they want to call it. And uh, we're going to look into that further now. And boy, the documents and the, you know, all these things are coming to light because journalists in the end of the day are journalists when they don't have somebody to hate like Trump. And so I, I think we're going to see some real journalism occur, hopefully on purpose, not by accident. We'll she'll see. Okay, long episode for six six six. Should we go six hundred and sixty six minutes or six minutes? Now we'll stop here at fifty six minutes. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode six hundred sixty six of Anglican Unscripted.